to all the listeners, um, outweigh your fear and outweigh your impatience and keep applying your skills. I interned at Late Night with Conan O'Brien, and you were the only writer who I bugged that was nice. (laughs) (laughs) The state of comedy is healthy because you can find things based on your friends or what's in the social media verse. There's much more choices now than there used to be. The thing I would tell myself is this, there's always somebody dying in their field because they just stick around. (laughs) (laughs) And when when they die, you'll be there. He wants to know (laughs) what you think the most frustrating thing about working in one of those more traditional media settings is. Uh, Your ideas are expensive. That's the biggest problem. Hey, welcome to the Create Unknown, the home of Make Something Mean Something. It is TCU night, Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Eastern. We are live on Discord with our dumpster crew, our baby gang, our infantry, our $2 tots. And the rest. We uh, with me as always is Matthew Tabor. And before we get started tonight, we have to mention a little bit of a uh, farewell to the dislike button on YouTube. Yeah, it's not a total R.I.P., but it's I'd say it's been nerfed, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's the right way to put it. It's just when something has grown too strong, an update comes along and softens it. And uh, the dislike button terrified too many people. <laughs> do you think, Kevin, do you think that they claim that there's all sorts of research and modeling that led to this decision? Uh, how much do you believe that? Oh, very little uh, on that end. Very little on the old research and modeling thing. I mean, I'm sure they've done some, but gosh, uh, what really went into it other than somebody probably complained who they wanted to make happy or several people complained who they want to make happy and yeah. they're making them happy. And that's that's probably the extent of it. That, that's usually what it is oh. with YouTube changes. It's it's usually like a PR thing. Like, uh oh, this is making us look bad. <laughs> Better do something about it. Yeah. So well, I, I don't think it's fully rolled out yet. So go to the the channels that you dislike. Find the videos you hate the most <laughs> and hit the dislike button now, so that you can you can get the full power of it while you still can. So you can get that that satisfaction. That you know it, it will eliminate the satisfaction factor of the dislike button. Like the people who. Follow, <laughs> go to channels, you know, like first dislike is gone. That, that person, yeah, like true, the first true. list dislike dude is gone. But so, so farewell to first <laughs> dislike dude, farewell to the dislike button. But, um, I, I, without further ado, would love to get into tonight's guest. I'm very excited to have him. We're going to go from the dislike button, which is a grim subject, uh, to a guest who is absolutely seething with joy enough to fill two comic books with that name and his latest somewhere in LA went to the publishers in July. You have almost certainly laughed at Jose Arroyo, even if you didn't realize it. He's a two-time Emmy award winning comedy writer who spent the better part of the past two decades as a writer and content producer for Conan O'Brien. Skits, monologues, uh, remote shoots, traveling everywhere, even drawing a <laughs> little Conan comic strip for the in-office newsletter. If the 2011 documentary proved that Conan O'Brien can't stop telling jokes, Jose can't stop writing them, which he seems to like more than performing them. And his origins in Ithaca confirm what Kevin and I have proven over the last 116 episodes that the most talented people in media hail from the Finger Lakes to Central Leather Stocking Pipeline in upstate New York. In 2019, Jose took a stab at creating one-panel comics for The New Yorker. This is easily the most prestigious publication for that kind of work, and he succeeded. He's had several published, including a hospital scene of an old man on his deathbed uttering his final regret. Not that not that he'd spent more time with his grandchildren or that he'd learned a foreign language, but that he didn't devote more time to arguing about Star Wars online. 
Jose has built a singularly unique career over a period of decades, and he's recently gone independent, having published a new comic book called Somewhere in L.A., which is available for five bucks on Amazon, and he's working on some scripts. But the question, Jose, at this point, you're free from the daily Conan grind. Are you living a life of Riley right now, or are you pouring that energy into new projects? Uh, I, there's no such thing as the life of Riley for me because I'm just too anxious a person, too eager to please, too driven to create stuff. So there's no kicking back. There was sort of a change in the schedule. All of a sudden, I didn't have to devote a bunch of hours to Conan. And, um, and so I was left to my own devices. And I think that's a, a big deal for um, people who have had staff jobs in anything creative. All of a sudden, that template, that schedule is gone and you're on your own. So you have to make up your own discipline and your own uh, times to work on stuff. And that has been a challenge. Conan's show ended what? on June. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was going to, to ask what you think the breakdown is. The percentage of people who sink in that situation versus swim. Oh, I, I'll say this. I'm very optimistic about humanity. And I think that if you stay in it long enough, you will, you will swim or at least die. And then your body will fill with gas and you'll float (laughs) either way, (laughs) either way. What I'm, what I'm advocating here is endurance and hanging in there. Um, because it took me 10 years to get good enough to write TV worthy monologue jokes and sketches. And it might take me a while as I'm pivoting now towards scripted to get to build up those muscles. And I just have to um, outweigh my impatience and uh, outweigh my fears and anxieties. And that's what I'm doing now. So to all the listeners, um, outweigh your fear and outweigh your impatience and keep keep applying your skills. I I want you to talk more about that because I was listening to an interview with you just kind of discussing your background, your journey, how you got into working professionally as a joke writer. And you you mentioned, you know, just now it took you 10 years, but I really want to hammer that home for people because it, it really wasn't just 10 years of like, oh, you know, I really wish I could do this. And then all of a sudden you did. It was like 10 years of, of hard work and practice and dedication and like constantly refining and trying how, trying to write jokes and, and sending jokes through some secret fax machine number to Jay Leno, (laughs) (laughs) like all of this crazy stuff that wasn't just like, you weren't just working at, uh, Burger King and wishing you could be a comedy writer. You were working on being a comedy writer that whole time. Oh, absolutely. And I was looking for any way in and uh, including overhearing from two comedians who were talking about, Hey, do you you know, uh, Leno's uh, secret fax line number? And I asked, what's that about? And it turned out that when Leno had the Tonight Show. He would accept submissions for jokes for the monologue from people outside, uh, you know, his writing room. And so there was a special fax line, and if they liked the joke, it would air, and they would send you some money. So I found out what the number was, and I started submitting to that fax line every single day. Uh, that was my that was my task, my chore. Um, and so I that's where I built up my my monologue writing chops is giving myself no choice but to write every single day. Um, And that's what you have to do. Like, I'm going to say this to any creators out there. There's a democracy of effort, which means if you put in enough time, then you are going to get good at something no matter what. If you play piano every day and apply yourself to learning piano, you're going to get better. You may not be concert level, but you're going to be good enough over eventually to entertain the people you want to entertain. So. Uh, again, I hate to sound like a guru, like an old man, uh, but I am both. And what I, uh, I'm, I'm urging anybody who's listening to just um, persist. Uh, it, it's, it's a little easier when you're younger and have uh, fewer, fewer responsibilities, but it is doable at any time. I'm currently persisting on learning piano and improving my drawing uh, and learning how to write scripts. So those are my new challenges going forward. Yeah. Yeah, we had um, we had Dean Lamb, who's a guitar player for a band called Archspire, on the podcast 
back in September. And he had this bit of advice that I thought was amazing that I'd never heard before, where he was talking about getting frustrated, trying to learn, you know, a new technique or something on the guitar. And his advice was, okay, you're going to get to that level of frustration where you can't break through, like you can't play this thing that you want to play. And you want to put down the guitar, but you cannot (laughs) do that. So his advice was, instead of putting down the guitar, play something that you can play so you kind of gain confidence again. So you're not putting the guitar away mad. You're, you know, putting it, putting, putting it away like an hour later or whatever, having played something fun. And that's you're no brilliant. longer like mad about this thing you're trying to get better at. I, I, that's great. Then you're conditioning yourself to remember that you love this thing, uh, that you're not as good as you want to be, but you're, but you have some stuff under your belt and you can, it, it, that sounds like a great way to soothe your frustrated ego, um, mm-hmm. that you're not quite where you want to be. That's a great, that's great advice. Mm-hmm. So what scripts are you working? Are you working on? TV show, movie, I mean, script yeah. is a very nebulous term. Script, scripted is very nebulous. The only definition I have for it is not late night. So <laughs> on Saturday night, well, it's, I mean, it's, I, it's a little blunt, but on Saturday Night Live, on Stephen Colbert, on any show that you watch, it's very quick hits, um, no longer than six minutes, even for, you know, a, a sketch on Colbert or, or a segment on, uh, on, uh, Trevor Noah or something, and scripted means a thirty-minute uh, commitment a story, like um, you know the the popular one now, Ted Lasso, but um, Big Mouth, the animated uh, story on on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. I I just it, it it's a it's a different muscle. It's fast twitch muscle versus slow twitch muscle. I guess if you want to compare it to uh, to muscles, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> So, so what I'm trying to figure out is how to maintain interest through a storyline from from you know page one to page 33 or whatever it is, and that and specifically for TV, um, I like television. I love I love watching it. I love laughing at it. It's it's you know uh, I love movies too. But but I think if, where I would want to make a difference is in television, and uh, I. I have an idea for an animated show. I have an idea for a st- traditional three camera, you know, Big Bang Theory style sitcom. And then I have what, an idea for a dramatic, sort of more of a dramedy. Um, right now, if I want to confess to your listeners, I am a little bit paralyzed by those three choices. Which one do I, do I take all the way to the finish line? Because right now mm-hmm. I've been kind of doing that spinning the plate thing where you keep running from one yeah. wobbly plate and spinning it and figuring it out. I don't think that's the, based on my experience, I don't think that's the best use of my time. I think taking one all the way to the, to the fade out might be better for me. Mm. Got to choose a plate. So yeah, got to well, choose a plate. <laughs> I thousand for that. I got to choose a plate. <laughs> we had, um, we had Mark Douglas on the podcast last week who had a very, very successful comedy YouTube channel uh, called originally called Barely Political. And then it was more a song parody channel called The Key of Awesome. And uh, we, we, we talked to him about uh, kind of like the, the journey of a creative person and the beginning and the end of a thing. And then what you do after the end of the thing and kind of what I admire about what you're doing right now is that you did the late night comedy thing obsessively for decades at the highest level imaginable. And now you're kind of starting over again. I mean, not completely. It's not like you're trying to become a a basket weaver or something, but uh, (laughs) (laughs) in some ways, you know, like you said, it's a new muscle. uh, It's a new art form sort of, or at least, at least a pretty strong pivot. Um, To me, when we talk to creatives, That seems like such an important thing that I wish more people would recognize in themselves, at least, is um, being excited about new journeys like that, new challenges. Yes. So I'm I'm afraid I didn't hear the Mark Douglas uh, interview, but what was his pivot? He's working on it. You know, he's working on um, an album, uh, but he's not doing the YouTube thing anymore. He's trying to focus more on, on, on music and putting an album together, but it's he's kind of midstream with all of it and, and also kind of working on what 
uh, Matt mentioned at the beginning, which is kind of like this, how, how, how do you self-discipline yourself when you're no longer mm, locked yeah. into um, a steady, because he had the same thing. He was like, I'm going to make two videos every single week and I'm going to put the horse blinders on and I'm not going to think about anything else. And then you take the horse blinders off and you see the whole wide world and you're like, where yes. do I fit into this thing? So that's exactly what happened. Conan taped his last show in late June and suddenly like July was this wide, nearly snow blind expanse of potential and nothing and I immediately, I, I, I told my friends, I hit the ground running in place. I hit the ground <laughs> running in place. <laughs> I, just, I, was, I was saying, oh, let me, uh, let me do a series of independent films and I'll get those on the uh, independent film circuit. But I also had this idea for a funny video where I sing. I want to learn how to sing and I want to play piano. I, I can play a little bit. Uh, and, and then also, naturally, my my agent is looking for sitcom pilots for you know to put myself out there so I can get paid to do something. But you know, I have a little money set aside, so it's not really urgent. And so I I really was the you know the paralysis of too many choices uh hit me in in June. And uh it actually after the excitement and nervousness and anxiety and whatever curiosity about being free faded. I hit a low emotional point. I was like, oh, God, all right, well, nobody's knocking down my door. Uh, the skills of late night, which I told my agent I'm not interested in, in working for, for late night anymore. I really want to do something in the scripted. And she very, very uh, diplomatically pointed out that there, there are two different styles of writing uh, and that I have zero kind of expertise in the scripted side. Um, but I know, But I know that I'm that I'm a good learner and I'm an eventual learner and I'm a fairly stubborn person. So those things are, are what's keeping my motivation to, to write, uh, alive. Um, there's a, it has very little to do with talent. I think it has to do with stubbornness and not, and not giving up on yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, well, but, Conan is, yeah. is still doing shows. He's, he's working on oh. some sort of HBO show. So what made you decide to not follow him to HBO? I, Love Conan and I love late night, but it has been like that you said the better part of two decades working on that. And during the time that I was with Conan, I started writing a few scripts and watching TV. And I noticed that I gravitated toward toward sitcoms and you know things like Bob's Burgers or uh, or even drama, Mayor of East Town or something. I wanted to be engaged over a series of shows over the same plots. And I thought this, this feels like something I would knew something that I would want to try. So, um, I, I thanked him. I was offered, uh, an opportunity to stay. And I just said, I, I have to try this, this other thing. It's, it's calling me from inside my head. So I can't ignore it. I think I put it off for all sorts of reasons. You know, the money was great over at Conan. Uh, I was, I was doing, you know, well, I was being praised and received, uh, you know, a lot of compliments for the things that we were doing as a team. But in my heart, I was thinking this, you've done this, you've climbed this mountain, and now you're just circling it, you got to mm -hmm. go find another mountain. <laughs> <laughs> so I look, I'm looking for another mountain. Now you, you catch me, you, you find me between mountains at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> Sans mountain. Yeah. Sans Mountain. I should play, put that right at the top of the resume. <laughs> Sans Mountain. That'll, that'll draw in everyone. <laughs> but the, uh, well, the, the things like drawing and, are, um, and cartooning and everything are just, the, I think, the same uh, sort of branches of the same desire to amuse or um, yeah, entertain people that, I, that I've had since I was a kid. It's a positive mm -hmm. way of getting yeah. attention. Uh, I, I, you know, I, it's it's something that I know I, I can do. I've practiced and I've gotten good at. Um, but the transition is is challenging. I, I think it's if late night is whatever a clarinetist at an orchestra. I think I mentioned this to other people. Then you know you're a clarinetist in an orchestra on late night, and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I've done the orchestra thing. Now I want to be in a really modern jazz combo. And you go there and you know how to play classical or <laughs> clarinet. 
and they're going to say, well, yeah, that you need a whole different set of chops to play avant-garde jazz mm -hmm. on the clarinet. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I'm now learning. That's that's my new my new challenge. Mm. I hope it doesn't take ten years. I doubt it'll take ten years. Uh, the clarinet player has uh, you know decades of of clarinet knowledge uh, that they just have to adjust to the new format, and that's what I'm hoping I can do in in drifting into scripted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let me tell you when when uh, I think I've only mentioned this once on the podcast, but the the reason that we know each other is because I interned at Late Night with Conan O'Brien. Uh, I think two thousand and five or six one of those two i don't remember i'm bad at remembering things mm -hmm. um and you, you were the only writer who i bugged that was nice <laughs> 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 actually talked to me uh and wasn't just kind of like please go away child um so <laughs> thank you for that and one of the things that this is going to sound weird but I had, I attracted me to you amongst all the writers was that you did that comic in that newsletter. And I was like, man, this oh, yeah. guy is obsessed with writing jokes that he <laughs> is even drawing a comic strip for kind of no reason, just for everybody in the <laughs> office. <laughs> like that was so That's awesome true. to me. So that was a the late night Gazette and it had a little comic strip page at the back of each issue. I think it came out once a month, but, uh, I did a little a strip called Lil Conan, which was basically, um, you know, a, a liberal borrowing of the Charles Schultz Peanuts character or something. Uh, it's just Conan as a seven or eight year old precocious kid who wears a little black necktie and a short sleeve white shirt. And he goes to school with normal kids. But he's just a little like a little, I don't know, maybe like a young Sheldon kind of kid. <laughs> uh, and I did that for a year and a, or over two years. And I think what drew me to you, Kevin, was that you too were doing comics at the time. I don't know if you remember, but you showed me a few um, strips. And I think one of them was two fetuses talking to each other in the womb. Does that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kevin, if I'm yes. lying, I'm flying. Am I, am no. I right? You're right. <laughs> You're right. It's okay, so perfect. Thank you. Yeah. What was that called, Kevin? It was called Floating Together. Floating right. Together. And See, yeah. I, I would have gone with uh, womb mates or. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> some other, I mean, it, was right, it was right there, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> She's just, dude. whiffed on that badly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Floating Together was the only comic that I did that other people liked. Like I did plenty of comics that I liked uh, and everybody else thought was terrible, but floating together was the one that, uh, because it was one drawing, it was the same drawing. I never yes. drew it again. It was just, I drew yes. two like weird looking fetuses and then I would just change what the one said to the other. Yes. Um, and I yes. must've done like 50 of those, but <laughs> it was fun just trying to come up with like, all right, I have these two babies in a womb and I only have room for one saying very few words <laughs> to the other one. Cause there's not a lot of room in the womb for, for, uh, you know, a monologue. Um, how big can their vocabulary be too? I mean, they're fetuses. That could be part that could be one of the jokes though. <laughs> that, <laughs> you know? So, you know, the director, David Lynch, had a comic strip that he did pretty much the same thing. It was three panels, and he never changed the illustration. He just changed the captions or the, the, the word bubbles on them. It was called Angriest Dog in the World. And it's, it's a dog, like, growling at the end of its chain, just, just bug-eyed and crazily angry. And then to cap the, the, the bubbles that were coming in, I think, from the house or whatever in the drawing, were what changed so you have basically you know you're in good company with that keep the, keep the <laughs> drawing straight and then change the captions david lynch is your is your uh creative yes. godfather there yeah yeah uh yes with complete crazy people like david lynch i'll take it i'll take it I'll, <laughs> exactly i'll take it yeah i think at the time david lynch would have said uh is too much for me because you were Kevin, you also had, um, you, you created a t-shirt that I still have, which is of a, a, this, I don't know if you talked to anybody about it, a potato wearing a sash of a mayor. Yeah. And he's got <laughs> this, 
<laughs> he's got this explosion, explosion, um, uh, one of those old cartoon exploders, and then it's tied to a birthday cake or something. <laughs> he's about to blow up a birthday. So it's Mayor Potato about to blow up a, a birthday cake. Yeah. Again, I don't know. I, I just thought I'm in the company of, uh, of a fevered mind. <laughs> and I do, but I in a good way, Kevin, in a good way. And I and uh, I anyway, I, I thought I thought that you were different enough that you were going to make your own mark. Um, I, and I think a little of that is was your fearlessness of, of trying whatever you wanted to try. Oh, man. Well, thank you yeah. for that. That's f- flattering. Yeah. Um, I was no, it's accurate, though. I, I want to add in that uh, those things like uh, potato trash comics, which some of the patrons have gotten new ones, you know, of uh, the potatoes <laughs> saying weird things. I've got that T-shirt that Jose talks about. The problem is I bought it uh, when I weighed 155 pounds and now I'm like 180. So uh, I'm, I'm I can't wear it until I slim down again. Um, but no, like Kevin, just back in that era, which I started to talk to you around then, you know, quite a bit. It just it's like, what's new? It's like, well, here's, you know, check out this thing that I did. And maybe it was the uh, the womb mates floating together uh, comics or maybe it was the potato drawing or uh, eventually. Uh, some of the YouTube videos, but you, you were just like, check out my thing. And that's it. And it didn't seem to, to really care if anybody disliked it. And it was, it was awesome. There was no uh, weirdness about it. It was just this kind of quiet confidence that, uh, that made it really work. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. Well, grown. Cry, yeah. Quiet <laughs> confidence, <laughs> mental grown. illness. It's a, fi- it's a fine <laughs> line. It's okay. But <laughs> exactly. But you know what, what you feel on the inside isn't necessarily what's conveyed on the outside. So if you were like, uh, either self-conscious or embarrassed or shy or something, it really, once, once people see what you've done, it's, it's out there and it's its own thing. So, um, any, I have to tell myself this, any hesitation or, oh, I should have, I can, I can do better or anything like that has to be put aside and you just have to put out things uh, and let the world decide whether they're good or yes. not or whether they like them or not. You have to get rid of that self-conscious, not get rid of it, but um, overrule it. Yes, mm-hmm. definitely. I think, I think you've got to recognize too, that you're almost always wrong about what other people think. You really have no idea uh, what's going on in their head, whether they, uh, even if they like something and you know, they like it, you don't know why they like it. You know, and I was, I was telling Um, Kevin a couple of weeks ago, this is unrelated, but kind of related where I was, (laughs) I was at an in-person auction bidding on this milk bottle from a dairy that I wanted. And, uh, it was a local (laughs) dairy. Yeah. And it was crazy. Uh, and this local dairy, I wanted the bottle. It was a very good one. And one woman was bidding against me and it was just the two of us going back and forth. And I ended up winning it. Uh, it was a, a three bottles actually. Um, mm. but it was obvious which one was the better one. And after she came over and just said, Hey, I know you got three. Uh, are you willing to sell this one? And it was the one that I wanted because of this yeah. amazing local significance. Um, mm. it, she said, a friend of mine, uh, just got a puppy with the same name of this dairy. And I know that she'd get a kick out of, out of this bottle. Mm. And I could have had a thousand guesses at why this other person was bidding against me on a thing. And I would not have guessed that at all. You know, I would have thought, Hey, she wants it for the same or similar reasons, but sometimes that's just not the case. You really have no idea what is going on in somebody's head. And the more comfortable you are with with not thinking you know how it's going to be received or why it's being received the way it is uh it's a little easier to to roll with it and just throw stuff out there and and see what happens Mm -hmm. the clock is ticking on 2021 and that's okay you don't need to rush anything this is the problem with hiring you're doing it because you've got a spot you need to fill yesterday and you don't want to waste any more time but there is nothing worse and there are a few things more expensive than not hiring the candidate who is the absolute best fit for what you need. Take a little time to do this right. Make a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs and reach a whole lot of the 770 million people on LinkedIn. When we started working with them, it was like 720 million. That's 50 million new people. It's wild. Focus on the candidates with the skills and experience you need. Filter them, sort them, and interview them. 
LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to interview and faster. Every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn. That is an entire California, 40 million people. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash create. That's linkedin.com slash create to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Seriously, have patience with hiring, but make sure you've got access to the best possible candidates. If you don't need them now, you will soon. LinkedIn.com slash create. Yes, I agree. Uh, anyone who's uh, had shared life with a significant other knows how easy it is to misunderstand each other. Um, and so why can't it, yeah. why is, shouldn't that not be true in the, in the creative world as well when you put something out? Um, and and I just curious, um, what did you wind up saying to the woman who said, my friend has a puppy. Can I get your milk bottle? Uh, I called her the C word. <laughs> no, no, I, no, I said, oh, just did. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. you smashed it over her stupid head. Yes, I did. Is the word three bottles, yes, one so over her head and then right. one in each kidney. Oh, uh, my God. <laughs> and, no, I was just like, oh, that's really crazy. I never... I never would have guessed that. Unfortunately, that's the one that yes. I that I really wanted. I really uh, and then want. I made some exactly. joke. The other one was the other one was for a uh, Cobble Skill Dairy. And I was like, Oh, it's too bad your friend didn't name her puppy Cobble Skill because <laughs> you'd be happy for you to have <laughs> this have one. Been. And she like giggled and we walked away, you know. All right. Wonderful. That ended the way it had to end. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Actually, I, I love a- any joke that can involve the word cobble skill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no question. No question. That's a rarity. That's, that's a good. It's already a funny word. Um, <laughs> uh, Jose, I want to get. I get. Want to get more to into some of your your comedy and and the skits that you did. You know, I, I a couple of uh, ones that you performed in do really well on the old YouTube's. The guy who has huh? never seen any Star Wars ever is so funny. And oh, shout um, out to eggplant farmers sorry. want you to stop sexualizing their crop. Um, <laughs> okay. Did you so, did you write as well as perform both of those? The two the two sort of performances where that have done well on YouTube. One was the Star Wars uh, guy who's never seen Star Wars, whose face is is painted to look like Darth Maul, and he has very logical reasons for that. And that was written by Todd Levin. Uh, just another black belt writer under Conan's in Conan's uh, team, and uh, and also I have to give a shout out. You in my credits, you mentioned the uh, the cartoon, the New Yorker cartoon that was bought. Uh, again, mm. the idea was pitched to me by um, by Robert Kuttner, who was a monologue writer for Conan. He goes, "Hey, I I just want to pitch an idea. Uh, you don't have to draw it if you don't think it's it's good." He tells me the line. It's a guy in his deathbed, and he says. I, I wish I had spent more time <laughs> criticizing people about Star Wars online, or something like that. And it's his whole family gathered. And not only did they buy that one and none, and none of the others, but it got a shout out from, uh, from um, Mark, uh, the, I'm, I'm blanking out of his name, from Luke, from Luke Skywalker himself. Mark Hamill. Mark, oh, Mark Hamill. Hamill yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. From Mark Hamill himself, he retweeted it or, or, or liked it and so on. And of course, that made it oh, even awesome. more popular. Imagine. Uh, so, yeah, that was a collab. I drew, I did do the drawing for that one, and uh, but it was based on the idea of uh, – I like to give credit where it's due. Or, you know, Rob Kuttner did that. Um, and as far as the eggplant farmer who wants you to stop sexualizing eggplants, it was based on that eggplant emoji uh, that everybody uses for penile references. And uh, I just thought – what if what if there was a company that or you know an organization that really just wanted you to focus on the nutritional benefits of the eggplant <laughs> <laughs> and, and not its uh, its similarity to a, to a penis? Uh, and that was fun. That was like one of the last things we did before uh, COVID kind of shut us down and and made us all basically do comedy from home. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Uh, yeah, but those were fun to do, and I I can look back on you know just just uh, decades of, of either monologue jokes or sketches that I, that I helped to do or, or created uh, on my own. I can't say enough about how much I love every aspect of, the, of those things. And now, of course, now that I can't do it or, or I am unable to, I realize what I had. Um, so I, I just remember one where the, off the story that 
LA zoo officials realized that one of their hippos was pregnant uh, and they didn't know it. And Conan said, well, they would have known it if they had taken this, our new sponsor. And it was for a pregnancy test only for hippos. So, <laughs> so we had to create a little stick that you had to have a hippo urinate on to let you know if she was pregnant or not. And the, <laughs> the sketch, it's, it's on YouTube. Again, it devolves into the, the whole joke is that the stream of a hippo's urine is so strong it keeps breaking the stick or sending it down, sending it down a river of urine. You know, it just keeps screwing up because you're dealing with a huge animal here. Uh, and so that's you know, that was a that was a fun one. And again, it has nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with society, really. It, they a lot of the stuff that Conan liked or gravitated to was sort of evergreen. So yeah. That's that's what I love about about Conan and the stuff that you guys did is that it was evergreen. It was just talking about like the silliness of yes of, of existence, really, in so many ways. <laughs> the, the 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 hippo pee reminds me of the gag from UHF where Michael Richards oh. uh, <laughs> has the kid <laughs> drink from the, the fire hose, <laughs> yeah, and just blasts the kid like across the room. Uh, time to drink from the fire hose. And then the kid just gets like <laughs> shot across the room from that fire hose Perfect. blast. But Perfect. Um, what's the process like to get to uh, for that sort of skit to become reality? How many does it does it beat? I mean, how many ideas uh, get thrown around and then how do you rank them and decide what you're actually going to produce? So that that really is up to the head writer to decide what to green light. Because when you say, yeah, yeah let's try the, the, the hippo pregnancy testing, you have to activate all sorts of departments. I had um, the special effects department create a high pressure hose, fill it with lemonade and fire it off camera onto a hand holding the stick. And, you know, all that sort of <laughs> takes, takes up, you know, shop resources and stuff. I had to create a belly <laughs> a belly for a hippo and then also a fake hippo foot uh, that winds up uh, you know, caught. <laughs> basically, I, I don't want to give away the end, but it appears at the end. And, uh, and so, so all those things had to be made and I would be, you know, get an email, Hey, can you come down to the shop and look at the hippo foot? Uh, and I go, okay, great. That looks like a hippo's foot. Um, can we put it on a stick so that somebody off camera can push it in when, when the time comes and, and so on. Uh, so all those decisions about what departments to mobilize, costumes, audio, the music department, and so on, play a, kind of play a role in what sketches can be done, you know, in that week or in, in, into the next week, uh, because some things may be too expensive or require too much travel and so on. And they, so the head writer had to make decisions based on, on those kinds of things. With the hippo <laughs> pregnancy sketch, nobody was waiting on it. Nobody was going to say, oh, you know, Kimmel did a hippo pregnancy sketch two days ago. <laughs> it look, look like we copied them. You know, so it was kind of like, again, thank, thankfully, it was so evergreen that it could sort of float around until we were ready to, uh, to shoot it in the back lot. And that's how, and that's how that, that happened. But the decisions as to what sketches come, go on the air are a factor of so many things. Like I, I imagine in the create unknown, you know, you, you're limited by the guest you can get, and and but also the time you have, and all these things, um, these external factors. Uh, so the more topical, the more relevant. Uh, Kim Kardashian did something at the time that I was on there, and it was very newsworthy. Well, certainly the head writer would want to do something to comment on, you know, the pop culture reference of the time. If the Emmys had just come out or the Oscars, we would try to do something Oscar related sooner than later, so it didn't look like uh, old taters, as they called it. Um, so, so that's, that's like, oh yeah, well that's, it, it, that, which would happen. You would have an idea, it would get, you know, replay, it would be sort of supplanted by a, a more fresh idea. And then you would come back and say, Hey, can we still do this? And so, you know, often the answer was no, that was last week. It's in the rear view mirror. We, nobody's talking about it in the culture anymore. So we got to move on. Um, but uh, those decisions, again, uh, pretty much the head writer, you had to pitch your idea in the writer's room. So the more fellow writers that laughed at your idea, the better chance it got 
to get to the next step, which was, all right, go make it. And that meant calling all the departments and saying, I need a hippo foot. I need, I need pleasant music that sounds like something on an ad. And I need graphics that show, you know, um, early, early, uh, you know, early announcements for hippos or whatever it is that was, I can't remember what was on the box, but, uh, (laughs) <laughs> but all those things had to be made. You know, a little box had to be made for a hippo pregnancy tester. Uh, so again, graphics had to be had to be notified, props to make the box and all that. Um, once you got the green light, the great thing about Kona was that you were the producer slash director of that bit. And so you were responsible for getting the music. You were responsible. It wasn't fobbed off on anyone. The writer brought it to rehearsal. And then Conan at rehearsal would either give it a thumbs up or thumbs down. But what came down to rehearsal was entirely your vision. I don't know of any other other shows don't work that way. Right. So on Saturday night live, if you have an idea, the writers come up with the idea. They have dedicated directors who will film that idea. Um, I don't know whether they have a say in the, in the casting or not. I'm, I'm not that close, but I do know for a fact that the writers themselves don't as a rule, direct their own stuff for sketches on Saturday Night Live, uh, you know, for those, for the filmed sketch, for their ads and things like that, for their parodies. Um, so, and uh, same on Corden. They also had, they also have people who are just directors who, who will do it. But Conan, I think, comes from a different kind of uh, a different background and, and just put a lot of faith in his, in his writers to, to bring something out good. Uh, and some of the stuff that, was truly trippy and wonderful came out of that uh, confidence or freedom to go go do something also some turds that you'll never see came out of that freedom as well <laughs> some horrific <laughs> bomby terrible stuff most of which didn't didn't leave rehearsal you know uh, but but some of the most inspired nonsense uh, is is basically based on that freedom uh, speaking of things that didn't make the show I was always surprised because I would always watch rehearsal that summer I was there. I was always surprised at the monologue jokes that would get cut. Like, like consistently I felt like the, some of the funniest things would get cut from the monologues, uh, jokes in particular. Uh. Why, why, you you got any insight on that? (laughs) Because like, what's up with that? And and some of the ones that would go to on air, I'm like, really that one? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So I, I can't, I don't know the process that goes on in Conan's head. I don't know what he's thinking when he does when he does that. Uh, because what's funny to you or me, maybe he's thinking, well, it's you have to think about that a little bit, or it's too, you know, um, it's more clever than it is belly laugh funny. Or we already did something about whoever the pre- you know the president was at the time. Um, you know, we already did a, a thing on Obama or or George W. Bush, so we can't use you know three of those jokes. We'll just use the ones that are more down the middle or something. Again, I, I'm totally speculating on what his thinking was, but a variety of factors went into picking the monologue jokes. And one of the ones that I thought was a fairly consistent was, is it is it fairly straightforward? Every now and then you'd get a really clever, brilliant turn of phrase or something like that. Uh, but if but if it's a you know, battle between brilliant and gettable and and you know a, a positive, strong laugh, then he's going to go with the in the safer territory. Um, he had whatever, however long the monologue was, 40 minutes, six minutes, to establish a rapport with the audience and get a sense. He's so, you know, Conan's antenna are so sensitive. He can read that night's audience so accurately. This monologue is a gauge of how much he can get away with, how in, into the show they are, and so on, uh, because every a- audience is its own animal. Uh, so I think what he wanted was to ingratiate himself as uh, reliably as possible with those with those monologue choices. And sometimes you're absolutely right. So some of the most clever, twisted, awkward, scatological, whatever, you know, stuff had to be put aside for the more sort of straightforward uh, monologue jokes. It was a it was a source of frustration for all the monologue writers who were like, oh, he picked that one. <laughs> that was a that was kind of a common phrase among us. You pick that one, okay? And all you could do is come back the next day with a, your new batch of mono jokes and and try again. And of course, the ones that you wrote were all brilliant and were supposed to be on the show. Uh, but the ones that got of <laughs> yours that got cut, you're just baffled with his with his thinking. <laughs> yeah. 
That's so interesting. I could see that yeah. as kind of like a, a, a gauge, a litmus test for the audience. Yes. So you kind of want like different flavors of jokes. That that makes sense to me. I could accept yes. that as an answer. But yeah, for all these years, that was like one of the a handful of things that always kind of stuck to me. I was like, I would laugh out right. loud in that that terrible intern's room watching the rehearsals <laughs> at some jokes. And then, and then I'd watch the show and I'm like, Oh my God, he cut that. That was the funniest one. He cut that. Yes. Yes. We were again, it, it, it happened quite often. And again, it's just whatever he decided would make the best balance of, of monologue jokes for, for the night. One thing we did almost always consistently is if there was a, a joke that involved, um, something sexual we would always leave it for the end because that was the that's kind of one of the more taboo topics in general and so it would almost always get the biggest laugh of some kind so uh you know in florida a man was something you know had his had his penis bitten by a crocodile well that's you know any joke that you make on that is is it's going to be hard to follow so that would almost always be the last joke something and we we called it um the cockaroo. <laughs> That's okay. Well, we got the we got the political stuff. We got the cockaroo at the end, and now we just got to put in all these middle jokes. <laughs> so it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, but before there's one more big topic I wanted to talk to you about before we transition over to our, our patrons questions. And that's just this like 30,000 foot view of comedy in general, because it's something we've talked about quite a bit on this podcast. We talked about it um, when we were paying tribute to Norm Macdonald who passed away. And um, we've talked about it with a few comedy focused YouTubers that we've talked to. Uh, my sense is that, uh, a couple of things. One is that I feel like people confuse something being funny with comedy, um, and those aren't the same thing. And because of that, I think a lot of people who think who laugh uh, think they like comedy but don't. Uh, ah, interesting. That might be a weird statement for people. But I've been thinking about this for a long time, and uh, and I truly believe this is the case. So I'm wondering your thoughts about that, about kind of like the delineation between things that are funny and manufactured jokes, humor, comedy. Because what you do is not the same as America's Funniest Home Video, child yeah. whacking the dad in the balls with the wiffle ball yes. bat. Those are different <laughs> things and people confuse them. And then the addendum to that. So, so what do you think about that and the confusion that occurs with people there? And then what do you think about the kind of the state of being a comedy writer or comedy creator in, in general? So uh, as far as people confusing something funny with comedy, uh, I, first of all, I, I love gags, you know, America's Funniest Home Videos. I, I, I set, I set my brow down a little bit to, <laughs> and, and just take it in and laugh my ass off uh, at, at, the, at that stuff. And I also love Fleabag, you know, the, the series. Um, on uh, you know oh, on Amazon uh, Prime is on Amazon Prime it's like it's so everybody's it's like your the width of what makes you laugh is very I mean what do you call it the uh, the continuum is very wide and you got low stuff like like dad gets you know kicked in the nuts and then very clever stuff on the other end that that, that you can sort of appreciate on a different level um, I I don't know if a drinking metaphor, like sometimes you want to appreciate a nice wine and sometimes you just want to get, you know, take three shots and feel the buzz right away and so on. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's different. It's different things depending on what you're in the mood for. Um, I don't, as far as like the state of comedy is, is concerned, I'm, I love it. <laughs> uh, I, I have a raucous, uh, you know, dialogue in my Twitter feed about, whether or not something is funny, whether or not something is, uh, you know, challenging to uh, the status quo, to a minority group. Um, and and I, I, I just think that the comedy sort of, it kind of pushes through all that stuff. Uh, and you wind up finding really funny stuff all over the spectrum. And some of it, like you said, uh, is, is um, low and some of it is, is high. But I, I don't think that it, I don't agree, or I would never say that that comedy is being threatened by any kind of like 
a desire to be more mindful of, of unrepresented groups or anything like that? Absolutely not. Uh, I, I just think it's, it's evolving uh, the way music evolves, the way other things evolve. Oh, yeah. No, that's that not the, what I was implying. What, oh, what, okay. Because I think I just yeah, want yeah. The, the non-answers. Uh, <laughs> if there's <was> non-answers. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. Let me, I think I, more, I think I want let me be more specific. Let me be more specific. So um, I feel like like the like the comedy movie is kind of gone. Like, oh, uh, like what happened to comedy movies that everybody talks about and everybody thinks is funny and rallies around as kind of like a culturally hilarious thing? Uh, uh, I, I don't know. Like, that seems gone. And then as far as comedy shows, uh, they still exist, but 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 kind of like everything these days, it seems like they just exist in pockets. It's like a niche yes. within a niche within a niche over here. And you have to be like really into a thing. And if, unless you're really into it, you're not into it at all. Um, <laughs> I just I agree. I think it's getting weirder. Like comedy is it getting is. We weirder. <laughs> well, wait, I think you, you put your finger on it when you said that, you know, there's, there's subsets of comedy and it's, I think it's gotten more niche. If that's the, if that's the word where you, you know, love, uh, you know, the, the work of, of Maria Bamford. And, and so you, you know, you go and watch her, her stuff, but it's not for everybody. It's just for you and the tribe around Maria Bamford. Uh, I think it has gotten a little more specific and, uh, you know, Joe Rogan's audience base is huge and, uh, and, and Maria Bamford is small in comparison, but I, you know, but people find their tribes. I agree with you that there hasn't been a big tentpole comedy movie recently that has everybody talking uh i would say maybe was would you say borat was the last one or or man that know, was a maybe, long time ago though yeah, holy exactly, cow exactly exactly okay well what's a yeah. more current one uh has this comedy stuff migrated to streaming and and now we all know of ted lasso but it, we didn't see it in yeah. the theater yeah and that's and that's tough because the number of people who can access ted lasso on apple plus or whatever is is just uh, a subset of the population yes. that's not a tiny it's, tiny tiny subset but it's not it's not 80 percent of people and that's 80%. hard because uh, 30 years ago uh 80 of people could turn on their tv and watch uh watch seinfeld and 40 years mm -hmm. ago they could watch uh, uh taxi or cheers or something like everybody had that the jeffersons was was that's right uh, you know before that and then just everything was easy for everybody to experience at the same time and now it's like, well, have you watched Ted Lasso? No, I don't have Apple Plus TV. Right. I have, you know, <laughs> seventeen other streaming right. services instead. Right, right. Bringo or some whatever the latest latest thing is. Uh, Cobble Skill. Cobble Skill. <laughs> oh man, I, guys, if you haven't if you haven't subscribed to Cobble Skill, get on it. They have some of the best content. Nobody's moving the envelope like Cobble Skill. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. that's great. Um, <laughs> well, it's niche stuff. I wanted to I, ask you, uh, yeah. I want oh, sorry, go on, go on. Oh, I was just going to say uh, that, that you know, I, I recently discovered what we do in the shadows. It's about, it's about vampires and it's hilarious. I can't even tell you what streamer it's on, but they're, they're they kill me. Uh, and uh, Kristen Schaal <laughs> had, a, had an appearance in this uh, most recent season. I'm a huge fan of hers. And so, so we, I'm going to say the state of comedy is, is healthy because you, you can find things based on your friends or, or what's in the, you know, in, in, in your social media verse that you're going to go, oh, okay, let me get, let me check this out. Let me check that out. Uh, there's much more choices now than there used to be, but you're right that the audience has shrunk and I get the feeling there, you know, we were watching it happen in real time on Conan because when I started there in the early 2000s, very few, very little competition except from other you know, major broadcast networks. And then we come to the end where we're on TBS and you know, the, the, the ratings numbers have shrunk, but they shrunk for everybody because there were just more, more things to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like they just flattened so I, and spread. They flattened and spread. They flattened and spread. I think that that's going to happen. Uh, when people, you know, uh, it, that happens well, well, almost with every new edition of, of technology, when people could have their VCR cameras, video cameras, 
suddenly they could make their own episodes of things. And uh, um, so the more technology spreads, the more you know you can do on your cell phone and everything, the more content there's going to be. There is a, a quality uh, cutoff that, that you have to reach in order to make it liked by, by lots of people. And that takes time to acquire. So, you know, you, the, the, the good news is you, can, you have a camera, you have, you have an unbelievable editing technology, uh, you can make whatever you want. The bad news is it takes time to acquire the skills to know pacing and timing and humor and all those things. But time is all it takes. So, I, again, I encourage people to keep trying. Well, speaking of time and how much time it takes, I know that um, <laughs> Matt wanted, wanted to circle back real quick before we go to questions, yeah. uh, talking about the time that you put in so that our listeners understand that they should be patient with whatever it is that they're chasing. Right. I wanted to go back uh, to one of the first things you said about this uh, secret fax number to Jay Leno. Were, yeah. were you getting were you getting paid for anything comedy related at that time? No. At the time, I was working for a guy writing trivia questions for one of the early online trivia games uh, on a something called Prodigy, which was even before oh, AOL. Wow. It was way a long time ago. Yeah. And so at the time, I just said, um, you know, I was a comedy writer. I was a comedian. I was doing stand up in small places in New York. And um, so, but my day job was writing these trivia questions and um, I was not getting paid for anything really because the, the stand-up comedy was like, yeah, you're lucky to be performing here. Uh, when I was working for this guy, I said, yeah, there's this fax line. And uh, the thing is, they said you need your agent to, to um, give you, you know, to, to get, grant you permission to get, to, to use the fax line. And he said, my boss said, okay, I'll be your agent. And he wrote a cover letter and he faxed it to NBC. I represent Mr. Arroyo and he would like to start submitting. And we get all this paperwork back. I sign it. We send it back. And suddenly I was one of the people who could who could fax stuff into Jay. Um, and that gave me, like to put such wind in my sails because now I had a task. I had to turn in five or six jokes every single day, the top quality ones, uh, and fax them into to Burbank by a certain time of day. Uh, and that just gave me a lot of... Uh, like it gave me a task to do, something that I could focus on. But no, at the time it was not being paid. And even as I was faxing, I think he used one every two or three months, something like that. I was probably one of hundreds oh, of wow. faxes. Yeah. So it wasn't about the money. I was making money with day jobs, with temping. I temped and day jobbed for 10 years before uh, I, I got my lucky break. Um, so yeah, it, it takes it takes a while. What I didn't do is give up. That's all. I just didn't give up. I, I I, I, my dark sort of, uh, you know, the thing I would tell myself is there's, there's always somebody dying in your field, Jose, just stick around <laughs> and, when, and when they die, you'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> I just gotta literally I like outlive that. the competition. I gotta outlive them. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to ask about this because you've had this progression where you were grinding, uh, you had the, the temp jobs, the day jobs, trying to get this other thing going. It's really similar to what Kevin talked about, uh, it has talked about in many episodes about his path. He fried a lot of chicken wings on the way to yeah. uh, an opportunity, but I'm constantly seeing on places like Twitter, uh, freelancers, especially, uh, not not accepting that this is a viable path you know they're saying straight away you need to charge what you're worth and you you can't give away anything for free and it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to <laughs> it doesn't seem to work the way they want it to work it's a lot closer to the story that you're telling so how do you get somebody who's 19 20 years old they want to go into TV, they want a YouTube channel, anything. How do you convince them that, yeah, you're going to have to do a lot of stuff for free for a very long time and then make the most of an opportunity when you get it? I, I wouldn't even try to convince them. I would just say, go, do do what you think you have to do to get somebody to hire you and, and see how that works out for you and take back that feedback and, <laughs> and, keep, and keep trying. I did this. I, I looked for ways 
to get on staff to to get the attention of people in LA. At the time, I was not living in LA, so that may have delayed my career by a couple of years by not being in the town where I could take a meeting. Mm -hmm. But um, but I can't argue that it took me ten years from when I graduated uh, college, twenty two, to my first paying television gig at thirty two. It took ten years. I, some for some it might not take that long. It might take you know three years or four years. But there is something if you if you uh, practice if you practice piano if you practice uh, taekwondo you're just better after ten years of practice than you are after four years you just are it's the same with anything creative yeah. uh, there's a little bit of a ma mystical magical aura around creative things like drawing or or singing or something but there's a ton of very prosaic beige colored practice <laughs> behind anything. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, that's just it. And you're, and I don't even have to tell you that you'll, you'll see, I'll just say, you'll see. <laughs> no, they <laughs> will figure it out one thing. It's true. And if they, if or they it'll do, work out they, for them. And then the way they yeah. wanted to do it worked. So it's, Wouldn't it's win-win. Win. There's outliers too. There's people who are like, you know, Conan once talked about a comedy duo. I won't mention their names, but one is famous and the other is not so famous. And Conan goes, yeah, fame has a way of being like that that arcade claw and he goes you yes you <laughs> no <laughs> so, and it's uh, there's a there's an element of randomness to it there's an element of what the culture is looking for at that moment um and you know sometimes like you said the, the lottery balls line up and you win but for the mm -hmm. most part you just have to keep uh, you just have to keep at it until this quality that you know you have did you know you're you're capable of uh, is is met with your ability your ability to generate that quality, um, but it takes time. It takes time. I'd love to play. I'd love to play piano the way I want to. I just can't. <laughs> but someday I will. So <laughs> I just got to keep practicing. It really it is. Well, I it should be almost reassuring to know that if you keep practicing something, you will get better. There is no magic to it. Uh, it's. Yeah. If you're enjoying well, it, if you're enjoying it, you know, you're, you're living your best life. Yeah. But we're in an instant gratification society, <laughs> Jose. I know. Don't you and understand rent, that? <laughs> and the rent is due. I get it. I get it. I get it. Welcome to the world. Welcome to life. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what it's like. It's, it's, you want, I want it. Uh, you know, I, I want enlightenment now. I want, I want, want happiness now. I want every satisfaction now. Uh, yeah. Okay. But just, you just do your work and, and something will come out of it. Um, mm -hmm. it, it does, it takes as long as it takes. I, it took me, like I said, 10 years, you're, you might be five years, might be two years. You might be get you know, very lucky. You might have parents who have, you know, connections that can get you something so much sooner than somebody who's been, you know, working in the, um, uh, central New York leather stocking region. As you said earlier, uh, <laughs> they might take, you know, they're plugged in. They get it. They get it done faster. But if you're good at something, you're good at it, uh, and that t just takes time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that is great advice and and a great yeah. point for us to just hit some of our patrons' questions. Um, some probably, I'm sure they're very specific Conan Hi, questions. Um, so Matt, uh, if you want to those. Throw, yeah. throw those around. We have a couple of those. Um, sure. First one is from Jeff, one of our babies. Of all the pieces that you wrote for uh, Conan's various shows, which was your favorite? Uh, well, one of my favorites, I, I have to say one of, because, uh, you know, it's like, well, which kid do you like more? You know, I have to say, oh, I love <laughs> you all the same. But there's one that I like because it was so technically challenging that we did it on the, uh, on the Comic-Con shows. And it was it was Conan announcing that Aquaman is going to spawn live on stage behind him. And so it was basically Conan narrating how Aquaman was going to come in with Aquawoman and they were going to recreate but basically the way the way salmon spawn. Uh, so we had to hire a rig <laughs> out of out of Las Vegas to suspend two actors who would like float out over the behind Conan at the Spreckles Theater against a backdrop of water that we had, you know, that we were generating. And then they would do, they would float out. Of course, that would get a big laugh because they were suspended behind Conan above cables and so on. And then Conan would say, and then after an intricate, you know, 
mating dance, and they were doing a silly mating dance, the <laughs> the female uh, aqua aqua woman releases her eggs, and we had to get, I guess, fifty or a hundred orange ping pong balls to drop out of a sack that she had <laughs> suspended twenty feet in the air. And they drop all over, you know, the floor. And then he comes over and fertilizes them with this weird powder that he had all over. And then uh, if, <laughs> if that wasn't enough, um, Conan says, of course, unfortunately, after they spawn, they die. And so they, they're rolled back onto the stage upside down now, dead. Uh, but then we project the babies <laughs> being born in the back screen. So it's like, but that's just... Well, it's like, I, I want to say the circle of life, but Disney has a song and we don't want to get sued. So we'll call it the Oval of Existence. And then the band kicks in with a song <laughs> called The Oval of Existence. Now you're here. Now you're not. Oval of Existence. One shot is all you got. You know, it's, it had music. It had spectacle. It had stupidness. It had it was not tied to any, any news item. I don't think even Aquaman movie was coming out. Maybe it was. I don't know. But the point is, it was a compilation of nonsense that worked. So if anybody wants to look for it on YouTube, it's uh, Aquaman Mates on Conan. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one thing, just real quick before we get back to our patrons, that I always loved about Conan's show were the, the, the characters. Like the, uh, like the recurring skit that was just like rejected sports mascots. <laughs> yes. Like those, oh. those kind of bits just killed me because it gave you an opportunity to just come up with the weirdest stuff and like weird anthropomorphic characters. And I don't know, like you don't get to see that a lot of places and Conan, you could see that kind of humor. Exactly. And when you're half tired watching something on TV and suddenly, um, you know, a, a big bird made out of post-it notes is trying to dribble a ball and, <laughs> and dunk it. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, this is so stupid. And by the way, this is so stupid was one of the biggest compliments you could give a sketch on Conan because it meant so much. It meant it's funny, it's it's dumb, it's random, and no other show is going to do it. So, um but yes, yeah, so, so NB, you know, NBA mascots that shouldn't dunk was a re what we call the refillable. And it, that just let the, uh, the writers come up with anything. Uh, and we had a, a, we have a genius, uh, Scott Chronic at the costume department who could, he and his team would just put together anything you wanted. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> NBA mascots that shouldn't dunk. That's what it was. Yes. That was one of all, there was. There were there were others like that, but yeah, that was one rejected X Men characters going by or further back. Uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, there's the superheroes so that funny. are not that are not in the you know that are not that, that are in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but do not have a movie coming out about them. Things like that, where you would just sort of take on uh, you, you would you would do these grab bags of opportunities to to put on the dumbest costumes you could. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was one of the best things about Conan was was those. And again, it took a lot of a lot of costume time. It was probably wildly expensive, but uh, the budget I always thought was a servant to the creativity on Conan. I, speaking as someone who had nothing to do with the budget, but I was really proud of what they would say. Oh no, we're going to spend as much money as we need to to make that look good. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, to their to their credit, they did that. And they rejected mascots or any of those. Things where we, we had a, a series of people coming out in, in costumes was was yeah, I looked forward to that when I was watching late night. I love those things. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's great. We do have uh, a question about some of those specifics, uh, some of those specific things that that uh, came up on the show. Uh, Wax Fonzie, Walker, Texas Ranger, Lever, and in the year two thousand skits. Uh, were you involved at all in in those? Not in the wax, <laughs> not wax Fonzie. Uh, Walker, Texas Ranger level, lever uh, was uh, the brainchild of uh, Andrew Weinberg and Michael Coleman, I believe, were the two writers who did that. And basically, they just we showed a clip of some over the top episode of Walker, Texas Ranger, and Conan just said, "All right, 
give me more of those. Those are hilarious. The, 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 you know, Chuck uh, Norris kind of overacting or things getting hyper dramatic. Uh, and he just said, well, why don't we just have a, le- a lever and you can call for them anytime you want. We'll just cut to some over the top episode. And I think the people at Walker were not happy <laughs> with it, but somehow under the protection of NBC, we were able to get away with it. Um, so that, <laughs> that was Walker, Texas Ranger, a hilarious, like almost surefire comedy bit for our, for our particular audience. They couldn't get enough of it. So much so that when Conan lost the Tonight Show and had and did a, um, a kind of a live show across the country. That was one of the p- pieces that was in the live show. It was the Walker Texas Ranger lever, and they would either get they would fly in a celebrity or bring in a celebrity from San Francisco or something to pull the Walker lever and start the clip. So uh, huge hit, <laughs> huge hit, a great memorable thing. If you again look it up on YouTube. Um, so that was Wax Fonzie. I didn't. I, I'm not familiar with. That was probably before my time. Walker, Texas Ranger, and what was the third one? Uh, in the year 2000. In the year 2000, that also was... preceded me. I, I, I there was. A, they actually published a book. It's. I don't know if you can find it on uh, Etsy. I mean, I mean on, on uh, eBay. But uh, there's an actual in the year 2000 book. So they compiled some of these things. The, the year 2000 was where. Conan and Andy would put on these smocks and put flashlights under their chin and make ominous or freakish predictions about what would happen in the year 2000. Naturally, this is before the year 2000. Uh, but even after the year 2000, they decided, let's keep using the year 2000. And and so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which so makes it funnier trade. it <laughs> makes it funnier it just makes it funnier so they would trade back and forth and between each prediction or announcement you would just cut to uh, Richie LaBamba Rosenberg the, the, tr- the trombonist singing in this high falsetto in the year 2000 and then, <laughs> then we go right and then do the you know they would do another joke and then in the year 2000 and back and forth. And again, that set a weird comic pace for that desk piece. Desk pieces were any piece that, that were done at Conan's desk. Uh, and, and yet again, it was as good as the jokes. And when the jokes fell flat, you could always rely on Conan to have a funny ad lib or he would just, he would just you know, squinch his face like he'd just been served a turd. And <laughs> but either way, he would, he would get a laugh out of out of the moment. Uh, and yeah, that was a that was a big big hit. Year two thousands. We wrote those. I think I don't know if there was like an actual schedule or anything, but it sounds like we would, we would do it once every four weeks when I was on there uh, at, at at its prime in its heyday. Uh, maybe maybe once every six weeks or something. But it was so popular, we just kept bringing it back. I'm glad people. Uh, still remember it that's great well we need to switch to the harsh realities of this industry um dan the latch has a a question that that's uh, it's more important than it seems he says i'm a film student who would like to be a screenwriter how do i get my parents to love me again (laughs) (laughs) oh my god oh my god so dan the latch it's the secret is they love you anyway. They just don't want to tell you. But they actually, they do love you. <laughs> I, I endured this for 10 years because I told my parents uh, I wanted to be a stand. I wanted to, first of all, I wanted to be a stand up comedian. And then I, I switched to, I, I just want to be a comedy writer. Um, but when I told them that I was looking to pursue comedy, and my mother, bless her heart, said, No, you can't do that. Everybody in the Hollywood knows each other and there's, there's, they're friends with each other or their family. You'll never break in. She says that was her thing. And then my father was like, well, why don't you get a PhD or a master's and then pursue comedy on the side, but then you'll always fall back on teaching. My brother, who was a car salesman said, listen, get your dealer's license and then sell a bunch of cars and then make some money and then go do the comedy. So everybody was giving me their advice on how to do it based on who they were or what they thought was a good idea. Um, and yeah. I just said, you know, I, what I'm going to do is keep a day job minimal you know, that won't tax me or exhaust me so that I can work on my, what I really love on my, in my free time. Uh, that's that's going to be the way I'm going to do it. Um, 
And so, so your parents already love you, but you're going to have to endure uh, weird looks and, and, and maybe a little bit of you know, sympathy or pity on you until you uh, show them something that they're going to be like, oh, Dan the Latch has talent. Oh, he's, I was wrong about this. Uh, but they're just looking out for your best interests. Um, the joke in my family was whoever buys a house, make sure there's a room in it for Jose. Okay, if you buy a house, <laughs> make sure there's a spare bedroom for Jose. And after, well, I'm after like 10 I years had. into this YouTube thing, and my parents are still like, all right, so <laughs> when are you going to get like a real career? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They don't exactly. say that, but you could you could kind of you can kind of pick up on it. It's like yeah, I think this exactly. is the real career. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I read the I read the question. I'm like, well, this is obviously meant to be funny in that way, right. but this is absolutely a thing. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. Absolutely I, a I thing. did the I did the 10 year the 10 year uh winding road to yes. A little bit of stability, and uh, that whole time, people are worried about you. <laughs> Naturally, uh, especially when when you're the last one who's not so stable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's completely it's completely real, and it's not just family. It's it's like you know friends offering those suggestions that do make a lot of sense. They're valid options. Go make some money and do this on the side. Go commit to uh, a day job and put your after hours into it. Um, yeah, yeah, it's there's real. Many ways it's, <laughs> there's many ways up that uh, mountain. Ever present. Yes, I, yeah. I, I, I agree. Uh, there, the way I did it is, is the way I did it. And if you can find a way to make it uh, happen while you have a fulfilling day job and, and uh, a side career, great. Uh, I just knew that I didn't have enough bandwidth to do both. But um, Dan, if you want to be a filmmaker, if you're a, a film student, Dan the Latch, uh, you know, give it, give it your all. Uh, be honest with how much time you're giving it, and and don't give up. I, I want to throw my own question on on the back of that one uh, sure. because one thing we didn't get to talk about earlier that I could go a full episode on with you is uh, what it's like to not be the Conan on stage because I've talked huh. many times in different episodes. I'm not the guy on YouTube. Uh, what I, you know, I, I'm the, uh, uh, I'm in support of, of Kevin's project and that's awesome in 10,000 ways. It, and I, and people don't realize that, uh, there are so many roles in so many of these productions that you don't have to be the point person on everything, whether it's comedy or YouTube videos um, you can be an amazing producer. You can be an amazing writer. You can do a thousand things that aren't being the guy. Um, yes. How do you, how do you get people to appreciate that and to think of those roles, uh, uh, like the one that you had, the one that I've got and, and not think it's, you know, cause you, you couldn't make it. <laughs> you couldn't make it. Uh, yes. it's not lesser. Um, you know, this really is, is a, a great situation. Um, how, how do we sell this to these kids? Uh, uh, you have to know exactly what you want or as close to knowing exactly what you want. So that, for example, I had colleagues in, at Conan who were amazing standups and every now and then they'd say, all right, I'm going to be doing this thing on, at flappers, or I'm going to be doing this thing at this, uh, at, at um, the improv. And come out and see me. And I thought, oh, man, I, they got the day job. And then they got this great, thriving stand-up career. And I, and I, I would check in with myself and go, oh, right. I don't want that. I don't want that. So one way you can sort of offset the fact that you're not you know, in front of the camera all the time or you're not the point person is to ask yourself, do you really want that? If you do, you'll yeah. figure out ways to get, to get yourself on camera. Uh, but if you... If you want to uh, do a, a different support role, for me, it was going out and seeing them do the comedy and, and you know, clapping and, and, and filling out the audience. And uh, I was happy to do that because I knew that I wasn't inter as interested in doing in the, st the stand up stuff. Um, when I when we were asked to perform in each other's sketches, like when when Todd Levin asked me to, to be the guy who had never seen Star Wars, uh, I was happy to do it because honestly, I wish I had written that sketch. It was hilarious. <laughs> it played so well in that crowd at the at Comic Con that I was a little envious of it. But I also thought, okay, if I can make it good, 
then I'll just be the guy who had to be two hours in makeup, <laughs> getting getting horns attached to my forehead and all that stuff. Uh, I'll do that part. Um, so so you're ha- I, if if the goal is to make something good, you find a place where your abilities can help make that thing good. That's I, I, well, I, I don't know real, that's, real quick. Uh, there was like something that, that you said uh, along the lines of this question in an interview that I watched earlier, where you said that writing the jokes made your brain light up in a way that doing stand up and performing in front of people didn't make your brain light up. And I love this concept of what makes your brain light up and yes. honing in on that and whether that is just doing the writing part or whether it is, you know, just just being the editor of a YouTube video and not, you know, the performer or just being the writer. Like what makes your brain light up, I think is a fascinating way of kind of characterizing that phenomenon. Yes, yes. So when I was writing jokes, I was really trying to solve a puzzle. Here's a, here's a news item that happened today. How do I make this news item funny? And, and uh, you know, it, how do I make it funny? So that was the puzzle I had to solve. As an editor, you're trying to maintain the pace of something. As a musician, you're trying to create a mood. Um, so you, we all have puzzles to solve within the, the work that we're asked to do. Uh, and solving that puzzle makes your brain light up like coming up with the right you know cut in, in an editing format or coming up with uh, the right chord in a song or the right word is what makes your brain light up um so some things some people are like the, the point people and the ones in front of the camera but it's these things are almost all entirely collaborative efforts and uh just because you don't see the person who's editing uh or or doing sound levels and things like that, they're, they're instrumental in the process. They just don't get the, uh, the face time, you know, uh, but it's a team. It's a, it's a team. Mm-hmm. Uh, did I, did I evade the question properly? Uh, or, well, or? we've got one from, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no. Okay. That was, perfectly, perfectly. Yeah, perfect. that was excellent. Um, <clears throat> I just, I just uh, had the, the little pop-up window disappear. And so I was waiting to get that back up so I could get the, the question in front of me. Uh, but we've got this one from Ben, who's done production work for us for a couple of years now. And he's in that Dan the Latch pipeline of yes. uh, formal education and the prospect of disappointment. He wants to know <laughs> what you think the most frustrating thing about working in one of those more traditional uh, media settings is? Uh, your ideas are expendable. That's the biggest problem. Uh, oh. Your ideas, you're, you're paid to generate ideas on a daily basis. So they become very precious to you because they came out of your head. They're your, they're your brain babies. And the show doesn't need all, the, all your brain babies. And some days they don't need any of your brain babies. And you got to go throw those away and start fresh the next day. And it is, it takes a toll when you're, when you're being paid to be sort of creative uh, uh, under, under a time limit, you put out your best stuff and a lot, I would say 90% of your stuff gets thrown out or not, or is unusable. So you have to get <laughs> used to that. Yeah. You have to get used to that. When I was writing for Conan, I thought, oh, we're in the, we have like a 10 minute block of comedy at the top of each show. We're trying to write a hit song every day for that 10 minute block. We're trying to make something funny, you know, that people will click on or want to rewatch every single day. Well, nobody can write a hit song every day. So you do your best. You give, you know, you, you do, you do as much as you can. Um, that's the goal, but you don't always meet the goal. And that frustration of working really hard and not hitting it out of the park every time is, uh, probably the most challenging thing. You just have to, kind of uh, acquire a thick skin and understand that that's just the way that, uh, like I said, a, a mass format like television works. That's why there isn't just one writer. There's 10 writers because because you don't have the hot hand every day. Someone else has the hot hand one day. Someone else has the other day. Uh, and all you have to do is be in the mix, be as good as the other people, and you're, you know, you, you'll, you'll have your, your sketches in the show as well. You just have to stay stay sharp and accept a lot of rejection. There's a, there's a quote about Moshe Dayan, who uh, was an Israeli sure. general back in the day. Yeah, uh, but he was he was a bit um, 
Uh, he's a bit different than than most of the others. And uh, the, the quote about him is roughly that he had he woke up with 100 ideas every morning and 95 were dangerous. Three were terrible. And the remaining two were brilliant. Uh, <laughs> and that's uh, boy, is that a good way to think yes, about creative yes. minds and accepting the fact that, y- yeah, you know, y- you write 100 jokes, you fax, you fax 100 jokes oh. to Jay Leno. Maybe, maybe. maybe. You one, hear one of them two, on the TV maybe. and you get a few bucks for it. And you get a few yeah. bucks for it. But you, yeah, and nobody, that's reality. Exactly. But nobody can take away that all that time you spent in the gym of your brain coming up with those 100 jokes. So you're 100 jokes stronger mm-hmm. in terms of coming up with stuff because of all that time you spent in your, in your brain gym. Sorry about the metaphor. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> that's great. It's true. Hmm. Yeah, oh, 95%. That's a good one. And the people in the episode chat too. Yeah, they're just going bananas over how important this whole concept is that you learn to deal with the fact that your ideas, your creations are to some degree expendable. Oh, for uh, sure. that's big. Yes, yes. And in, in, like I said, in mainstream wow. things, if you're a singer songwriter, if you're someone who, who says, no, I'm going to you know, uh, just do what exactly what I want, frankly, I, I would say expect a, a lower. Uh, income than someone who is trying to reach a mass audience because that you know a, a mass audience writer has to make more compromises or has to understand that you know, that their particular unique vision may have a smaller audience base than something generated by a group. So it's your choice. You can be a singer well, songwriter. You just have to accept that for a long time you may be making less money, or you can try to work on some you know on a big show with a big audience. And um, and make a few more creative compromises. Yeah, the uh, I did a, a couple seminars a couple years ago with people just beginning on YouTube, and the way I tried to put it was: think about a couple different people trying to start from scratch on a musical career. One band plays cover songs at the local bar, and some people start to start to show up routinely and they play bigger bars and whatever. And then at a certain point, they start to work in their original material. Uh, are they going to do better than than the guy who is just going to an open mic with his original songs and hoping that people absolutely love them, hoping the right person hears them? Um, well, my money is on on the cover band approach, uh, but you've got to be comfortable with with knowing that you're performing songs that aren't yours. I would say that 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 both ways could definitely lead to you know the the career you want. But the cover band is going to have more yeah. listeners. It's just going to have more people yeah. hearing that original song when when they finally let it you know, let it in than the person who's still doing their 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 stuff at an open mics. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you on that. And learning all those cover songs makes you a better musician, or, or you know, <laughs> you know a lot more chords. Uh, your musicianship is can't help but be improved. It's that's a, by the way a classic way of learning anything is to copy uh you know is uh, painters copy famous oil paintings musicians learn you know other people's music first before making their own um and uh, that's actually how i taught myself part one of the ways i taught myself comedy writing was to listen to at the time it was johnny carson uh or David Letterman, and I would literally type their monologue out and look at it and go, okay, that's the setup, and that's the punchline. What connects the setup to the punchline? Oh, it's this this reference to uh, you know, uh, you know, somebody was smuggling so somebody was smuggling cocaine uh, in their bra. Well, that was a real drug bust or something like that. It's some joke like that from the you know, from the eighties, <laughs> from the eighties or something. And I go, like, oh, okay. The, the joke, well, but the Boo. joke hinge, exactly. So the joke hinge is the word bust, and I go, okay. So the this refers to both drugs and the brazier. So that's the thing, and, and I would literally become very nerdy about trying to figure out what would make what makes a joke uh, ignite. You know, uh, I, I use the corniest possible example, but that's, an, you know, that's, that's how I kind of try to retrofit yeah. it. Uh, I've seen musicians who, <laughs> who, you know, go and take a piece of music and take all the chords and then play them backwards on a song to see how that, you know, how if that'll inspire them to come up with a new song. Um, so, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with, uh, co- not copying so much as, uh, 
you know, taking what other people have done and seeing how they did it. Mm-hmm. Part of that process is dealing with other people's ideas, giving your ideas to other people. And this is leads into Trevor's question. Um, we got one or two more questions for hey, you, Trevor. and then you're you're free. Um, but this is uh, it's about uh, how hard it is to make comedians themselves laugh. And in the situation you were talking about, <laughs> yes. the writer's room, all of that, how do you determine what's funny to them versus something that, for whatever reason, you find funny? And I want to tack a piece on how do the writers as a group decide uh, that something that's really funny to them is also going to be funny to 8 million people across the, the, the country? Um, I'm not sure how any how you decide what's going to be funny. Uh, in the writer's room, there's just there's you know swings and misses, and then there's there's ground balls where like okay, I guess that could work, um, and then there's just solid pitches that some writer brings in that you're going okay, that's uh, you know about this news item, that's about the you know the cruise ships, it's, you know something that happened on a cruise ship that happened just yesterday. We can have a character who is the captain of the cruise ship. Uh, you know, talking to Conan on stage or whatever. That seems like it's, it's, it's tailor made for tomorrow's show. So there was a lot of stuff sort of sifts itself out by not being uh, good enough. And then if there are two competing captain interviews with Conan, uh, it, it comes down to which one the writers in general, we kind of have a feel for the show, uh, is going to, is going to do best for our audience. Uh, so, so a lot of that decision making happens as a based on your experience with the show based on your experience with what's worked in the past um and and that's sort of what is what guides us to figuring out what conan's audience out in in the tv world viewing watching world uh will like um but as far as like trying to determine what's funny that's such it's such a vague thing you kind of know it when you hear it you know it when you're laughing you know like i don't Sometimes you're like, I don't know why that's funny, but that's <laughs> hilarious, and we're gonna try yeah. it. Uh, and so, <laughs> so those those we had like two or three writer meetings a day, and then the rest of the time we were in our offices looking for news premises, looking for Joe, you know, for for things in the culture that we could make fun of. Uh, and then when we were called in, uh, the the head writer would read the pitches. They were always anonymous, which is great, you know. That way, if there was any issues with between the writers or anything nobody knew whose ideas they were um and they would be read and we would kind of get a sense of what would work on our show based on on what what's worked before there are times by the way (laughs) when you know the comedy was very very down the road and we would we would kind of have like a raise our hand and go that's that's my that'll work paddle you know it's like you're raising a paddle that just says that'll work it's not quite hilarious but it'll work you know, you just because you know your show, you're doing your best. It, this is gonna, this is going to feed the crowd tomorrow. Um, they just weren't always home runs. Mm. Well, our <clears throat> excuse me, our last one is uh, coming from Gusau. What's the thing that made you laugh the hardest in the last week? <laughs> okay, uh, we'll go back a, a, a week before then because it, it's um, you can go two weeks. That's fine. <laughs> It was uh, Judd. Um, it was Jason Bateman in a clip from a movie called something like Spiced or something like that. But it was by the guy who did uh, the producer of uh, Silicon Valley and uh, Beavis and Butthead. I, I can't remember the name of that. Uh, oh, creator. Mike Mike Judge. Mike Judge. Oh, thank Mike you. Judge, Mike yeah. Judge did a show, did a movie in which Jason Bateman is forced by an aggressive pot smoker to take a big hit off of a bong pipe. Now. I was at a, I was with three other Conan writers. I had decided to do a writer's retreat up in the mountains nearby. And I said, guys, we're going to get a lot of writing done. We're going to be away from our distractions. We're going to go up to this writer's retreat. And I, I rented this little cabin and we're going to pitch each other our ideas because we're all in the same kind of boat. We're, we're kind of floundering. We're looking for what's next. And uh, this is going to be great. Well, not a lot of writing got done on the writer's retreat. Um, and I knew this would be an issue when, <laughs> when someone brought like a big bag of Kit Kats as well as chocolate edibles and just spread them out on this beautiful wooden table in this cabin. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So my plan, I even made it, 
I even made gift bags for these guys, like I, which I filled with like notebooks and <laughs> pens and little packets of coffee. I go, hey, writer's inspiration, guys, writer's inspiration. And uh, they're like, ah, oh, these are great. And then <laughs> we proceed the next three days, we proceeded to watch funny clips on YouTube, eat a ton of pasta, drink, and the people who partook, partook. Uh, and and I go oh and I had to like come to terms with the fact that oh this this retreat isn't going the way I I wanted to I better just you know relax into it and and let it be what it is one night one guy puts on this clip of Jason Bateman being intimidated into sucking a five foot long glass bong and for whatever reason that clip just hit me. And I had just had a very big pasta dinner that night. One of the writers had made his grandmother's bolognese recipe. So my stomach is at its bursting point. I'm full of pasta. And then this thing <laughs> comes on and it's making me laugh. But every time I laugh, I'm being punched in the stomach by my own stomach because it's so full that when I contract, <laughs> it hurts. And I'm in this <laughs> horrible... <laughs> mix of like agony i go oh fuck i'm being punched by my own stomach and that's even funnier than the jason bateman clip is how much it hurts right now and i was laughing and dying at the same time so that's the mm. hardest i've laughed in two weeks <laughs> that's a good answer man, man wow that's it that, that, my, that my, that's I think awesome yeah judge movie <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah, <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, we're gonna we're gonna let, uh, let you let you go on that one, Jose. Thank you so much for joining us. This hey. was definitely absolutely a huge pleasure of mine to have you on the oh, podcast, I've, man. I I've I've been a fan of yours and and of your uh, audacity, your bravery in in choosing your your own course and in succeeding, honestly. So, Kevin, I I really appreciate. It. I feel like something's come full circle. You being on your show, so I appreciate it very much. And Matt, thank you for your questions and and your and your contribution too. Yeah, well, like I said earlier, the uh, the the live chat. Uh, most most everybody in there is working on their thing, whether it's formal study, whether it's uh, sneaking in videos here and there. Some of them uh, play instruments, write songs. Yes. Everybody's working on something. And yeah, they've just gone bananas through all of this uh, because you've said so many eye-opening things, useful things, but in such a way that uh, that we can actually apply them really easily. They're sensible. They're not sales pitchy like so many of the, the things that we get. Uh, okay, you know, do it sure. this way or avoid that thing. No, it's very, very real. And, and everybody appreciated that. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad, man. I, I'm glad it worked out for you guys. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, and real quick, I just want to plug your comic book, Somewhere in L.A., A Book of Hours. It's on Amazon. It's also in Jose's Twitter bio. So if you follow him on Twitter, his handle is at Jose Arroyo Wright. Right as in writer, not as in That's correct. correct. And, uh, <laughs> and, and yeah. we'll put all these links in the description as well. Yeah, so anything sure. from the Amazon link to uh, Twitter link, uh, that'll all be at the top of the description. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a yeah. lot. Yeah. All right, we're out of here. Thank you again, Jose. And uh, uh, everybody be guys. sure to follow him on Twitter and uh, buy his comic book. It's five bucks. Hey. All right, we are out of here. See you, All Space right. Cowboys. Thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. We make this show with the support of our patrons. 100% goes directly to keeping episodes going every week. Thank you to the Tots and Dumpster crew who save tiny little lives every month. And thank you to our grizzled, battle-hardened child infantry. Jen Mafasanti, Kevin Menard, Mikhail Steinke, Risebread, Sean Malone, Triple Question Mark, Ryan, Kamikaze, Maria, Marco, Sheep, Tom Videogre, Jelksies, and Dan the Latch. And a tremendous shout out to our elite baby gang commanders. Linus and Trev's dead, Boromir, Bot Dogs, Chinchilla, Isaac, Conrad, James, Andrew, Jeff Davis, Patrick Pister, Baseweight, Monahem, Dojangles, and Zero. Again, you are the elite. Thank you as well to our indentured servants, producer, editor, Ben Webster, and producer, Dan Yosua. And thanks to Baseweight for use of the Created in the Unknown song for our opening theme, and to Electro Voice for giving us mics to sound good on top of it. The Create Unknown is an unknown media production in partnership with Studio 71.